Is Steve the most iconic video game character ever? All this and more coming up on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Games with character. From apples to oranges. And we've gone all floppy. All this and more coming up on this week's show. Up to date news for out of date tech. Good morning. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Twirlers. How Hello, Twirlers. You? How are you? <laughs> are you having a nice weekend? I had a nice weekend. In fact, I had a super busy week last week. We had three events at the cave, which is probably the first time I've done that. We had a corporate event. We had the kids' um, half-term Easter holiday event. And then we had our usual Saturday event all sold out. So it was busy. And it was great to see the cave in action so much last week. The corporate event. Who was that? Oh, you know I can't tell you. <laughs> That's why you're asking. No, no hint, Super secret. Nothing. Super secret. Did you have to sign an NDA? I did, yes. An NDA. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, guess what I bought? Um, something gamey. Did you buy a game? Yeah, I bought a virtual pinball table. Oh, okay. You were talking about this. Yeah, so now I went, this, actually this purchase bought it has accelerated because you had caveats on this purchase related to you were going to go on a health drive and when you yeah. hit a target you were going to buy a pinball table so yeah. wow you did it in a week dave yeah um so i bought a really basic chinese one you know those pandora things you pandora devices you know yes. what pandora uh, devices yes, for our, our listeners, a pandora device is it's a chinese made retro device that they've They've brought the price down as much as they can to still give you something worthwhile, but they're a bit ropey. Um, so this is the Pandora of pinball, but it's a really well-built pinball cabinet with all the, the, the stuff closing it in and three screens, but it's got the weakest computer in the world in it. So it'll be okay, but not very good. And it represents maybe a third of the total cost so I'm not going to do the upgrades that are necessary until I've hit the target. Oh, okay. Okay, so you've got Plus, the cabinet there. Maybe yeah. that will still be an incentive for you. And what yes. kind of PC is it in there? Is it is it a Windows-based Pc? Is it because it's Pandora a Windows is Seven Linux. embedded thing? Um, oh, okay. And it's a it's something like a a G four seven thirty in it. So it's it's a ridiculous thing. It's only slightly more powerful than the weak source Pentium inbuilt graphics graphics card on the processor so sure. it's always it's comically um terrible for it so i've got a lot of upgrades to do to it and i'm not going to spend not going to pull the trigger on those until it but i had an offer of this it's from someone who bought it and then changed their mind so i had an offer at a really good price it was too good to say no plus it might take a couple of months to get to me because it's in liverpool and the guy that does the the arcade moving about um for the archive, for example. Is this the famous Martin? That yes, it is uses. the famous Martin. <laughs> will at some point pick it up, take it back to his lock up, and then next time he's come up to Scotland, he will drop it off with me. So I don't know how I don't know how long before I see it, uh, but I'm not going to pull the button on the upgrades, the substantial upgrades, until um, that, that target's hit. So that's going to be my incentive. Don't want to hear about it again, Dave. Until that health drive is well underway, and you can keep us updated on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair, no enough, Neil. fair enough. Fair enough. No pressure. Have you bought uh, anything? Have I bought anything? Well, I bought the glass cabinet, which was last week's video, but oh, I yeah. think I talked about that last week. Um, and it's gone down well. I still need to update some signage. I'm thinking of putting a little screen above it, rotating um, gameplay oh, of all clever. the games yeah, that are in the idea. cabinet. Yeah. But I'm very aware in the museum of any wires, any cables visible anywhere. I hate it. So I need to find a way of doing it really nicely. So there's just a nice floating screen and you don't see any of the wires or anything. What like about that. what about even just gameplay screenshots from them and just have one of those, just have some kind of USB power bank powering it? Um, so like a, like a photo frame type yeah. thing? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. could do that with a little bit of text on each one to explain, you know, yeah. almost like a slideshow rather than a video. Yeah. That yeah. would be fine. Yeah, yeah, that would work too. And that way there's no cables needed. It's all just self-contained. Well, then you come into the realm of batteries and having to plug things in to charge them up and all the rest. I, I like, I've got everything on smart plugs on the museum for peace of mind when I go home. Mm -hmm. And when I come in and set up, I like to just be able to say, 
turn everything on everything what on. did you what do you like to do with the smart plugs in the archive when alex is doing stuff <laughs> Uh, yes, so I have been known to turn off the arcade smart plugs when Alex is live streaming. <laughs> just, <laughs> especially, he was he was live streaming one Halloween, I think, wasn't he? Doing like a spooky stream, and I started switching the arcades off, and he started getting freaked out on the stream. <laughs> and bad. We have actually removed nearly all the smart plugs from the arcade because we were finding the load that we were putting through them; they they couldn't handle it. Uh-huh. It was starting to cause some odd random issues with them and we thought no, we're just putting too much through them with the arcades so fine for some microcomputers but not so much a, a bank of arcades yeah fair enough shall so we one it my fun shall we get right into it? it yeah okay am i boring you dave let's go into story one never bored me <laughs> neil when you meet someone for the first time do you check out their geometry do you look at their pointy bits oh who doesn't dave who doesn't <laughs> Well, it seems a lot of people do. There was a BAFTA poll of over 4,000 gamers worldwide to find the most iconic characters, and Lara Croft won. Now, before anyone's forehead veins pop, I want to point out it was just 4,000 people voting, and they were voting now. It's not a panel of people trying hard to judge what matters over time and to create a proper curated list, because they would obviously have a different outcome. Um... Top of the list was Lara, but here is the top 20 in reverse order. Um, In at 20 is Nathan Drake from Uncharted. Uh, Then Ellie Williams from Last of Us. Kazuma Kiryu from uh, Yakuza. Um, Astarion from Baldur's Gate 3. Cloud Strife from Final Fantasy 7. Crash Bandicoot from Crash Bandicoot. Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid. Steve from Minecraft. Pikachu from Pokemens. Arthur Morgan from Red Dead Redemption 2. Shadowheart from Baldur's Gate 3. Kratos from God of War. Master Chief from Halo. Link from Z- Legend of Zelda. Why not put Zelda on it? The, the, the elf that you see in the front of it. Um, <laughs> <Stop> it. <laughs> Pac-Man from Pac-Man, Sackboy from Little Big Planet, Sonic the Hedgehog from Sonic the Hedgehog, Agent 47 from Hitman, and finally in second place, Mario from Super Mario. From Super Mario or from Mario well, Bros? Yeah, that's what it or says from on Super Kong. Mario. But he's from <laughs> he's he's from lots of different things, isn't yeah. he? Yeah, from um, Mike Tyson's Punch Out. <laughs> all big names but clearly just what people like right now in a snapshot so i thought neil we could do better so from their list we've already got i, th- I think these should stay pac-man mario sonic and yeah. lara croft i think i think they're safe they've got to be in there just from longevity if nothing yeah. else yeah steve from minecraft because minecraft is such a huge game um solid snake and pikachu I just remind you, Dave, it's not about... Uh, I know we've said those ones have longevity, those earlier ones, but they also have character. Now, you said Steve from Minecraft because Minecraft is such a big game. But Remember, you, it's know, everyone, character. Everyone, everyone knows who that is, I thought, well, until you told me you don't know who he is. I didn't know his name was Steve, to be honest. I recognised him. I knew yeah. he was the Minecraft guy, but I didn't know his name was Steve. Now, does that that, that says to me he doesn't have enough personality for me to have mm. known this the, is personality, remember. The, 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 uh, the icon, though, the, uh, he's he's iconic. Um, they picked two from Baldur's Gate 3. I would say, no, pick Minsk and his hamster boo from Baldur's Gate 1, 2, and 3 instead. So we're at eight from their list, so 12 of our own. Of course, no surprise to listeners, Lord British from Ultima. <laughs> Ping. Uh, Doom guy from Doom. Uh, I would say that... Uh, Master Chief from Halo is a Doom Guy knockoff. Um, Duke Nukem from Duke Nukem. Um, Dizzy from Dizzy. Dagger, we were putting Dizzy in there. I think so. Dizzy's got character. General of Riviera. So that's a huge RPG series. Lots of personality there, and even got a TV series. Which one, Dave? Oh, well done, Neil. Um, Gordon Freeman from Half Life. Gordon's alive. Um, Donkey Kong 
Yeah, I'm surprised Donkey Kong himself was not in the baffle yeah. list. Because, yeah, he's he's definitely a big character. Red Warrior from Gauntlet. I got away with that one. Why Red Warrior specifically? Because Red Warrior needs food badly. But they, they all do. Red Warrior is the first one, I think. If you look around the Gauntlet cabinet, it's Red Warrior, then Blue Valkyrie, then Yellow Wizard and Green Elf. Is that right? They, uh, yeah, they all have names, but they all need food. I mean, it just mixes up the sound samples, doesn't it? Well... Um, is it Quest Yellow, of the Elf? Quest yeah, of the Elf? Yeah, and... he shot the potion. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, you've got to pick one, so you've gone with Red Warrior. Fine. Guy Brush Street Wood from Monkey Island. Yes. Definitely. Um, Sir Graham of Daventry from King's Quest. Mm-hmm. Horny the Demon from Dungeon Keeper 2. Mm-hmm. And Commander Jameson from Elite. That's controversial because that's. I'll, I'll die in that you. hell. That's you, isn't it? Commander Jameson is the default name in Elite, so everyone who who picks played Elite and doesn't change the name is Commander Jameson. So why would you pick Lord British and not the Avatar if you're going to pick Commander Jameson and not? Because Lord British is in is in all the Ultimas, but the Avatar is only in from Ultima Four onwards. Oh, well done. Okay, okay, you can have that. Um, God, everyone loves loves a list, and there's no right or wrong answer to a list, is there? I, I thought, I thought when I picked those twelve, I thought I've not left much for Neil to pick, and I've looked at the ones you've picked, and you've done really well, Neil. Oh, I, I had my coffee this morning, and I thought I'd take a few notes. So, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe explain some of my choices afterwards. But I've gone with, and this is in no particular order. I've got the running guy from Track and Field. Yeah, uh, no, mustachio yeah, because- man. They they put a lot of effort into getting getting something from him. It's got character, hasn't he? Yeah, it's got character. This is what I'm trying to focus on. Um, I've I've got neck and neck, Horace or Roland. The problem with Roland is he was just the random character that they put a name onto. He's, he he's, was. He's got the same consistency in games as Lara Croft has, um, being reinvented several times. Yeah, Horace was a blob but he was yeah. always the same blob. Yeah. Roland was whatever game Amsoft have licensed this week yes. and stuck <laughs> Roland on. In one game, he's a flea. In another game, yeah. he's a man, you know, with a gun. Um, yeah, okay. Um, the Prince of Persia. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, plenty of character in that. In fact, one of the earliest examples, I guess, of a cinematic sprite. Yeah. Frogger. Yeah. Frogger's got character. You, you know, you care for the little guy. You, you get attached to him. Um, on the on the sort of fighting front, I've gone with Ryu and Ken, or maybe Billy and Jimmy, or Bimmy and Jimmy. Who's Billy and Jimmy? Double Dragon. Oh right, okay. Yeah. yeah. What about what about Gold Knights instead? Oh, go yeah, but that's, that's that's Butler. Pretty good. I mean, Street Fighter and Double Dragon, two slain. different genres completely. Mm-hmm. But I was just thinking about fight fighting maybe, people. Yeah, Ra- Ryu is the one probably at the top of the list there. Is he the good guy and Ken's a bad guy in Street Fighter Two? I don't uh, know. I think they're both good, aren't they? Are they? I mean, it's not yeah. a deep plot, really. Let's be honest. In Street Fighter Two, R- uh, Ra- Ryu feels like the, the the top one, doesn't he? There are definitely badder bad guys in Street Fighter Two right. than those two. I've got the Undertaker from Mad Dog McCree. Um, <laughs> maybe not character, just he just annoys you so much. He's very, he becomes very memorable. I've got Max Damage from Carmageddon. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's a pretty iconic face there. Um, Arthur Knight or Sir Arthur Knight from Ghosts and Goblins. Mm-hmm. Plenty of character in him. Dirk yep. the Daring, Dragon's Lair. Oh, from Dragon, yeah. yeah. Is that cheating? Because it's it's borderline not a game but <laughs> your next character. one is, is kind of you can argue the next one is somewhere along that that, that way to it sam and max lucas art sam and max come on yeah a huge amount of character in there yeah, Cat food. yeah. sam and max yes yeah <laughs> um max Payne. yeah broody dark character samus from metroid i'm i'm surprised that normally appears in any popular mm-hmm. list that comes up so i had to put that in there and i'm going to ra- round it off with the straight line from tetris specifically the game boy version yes because the straight line from tetris has the character because of its appearances 
when you need it, it's not there. When you do, need, when you yeah. finally get it, you get three in a row, and you end up with what do I do with all these? <laughs> You're begging for the straight line, yes, yes. Yeah. So you know, it, it's a headline catching story. This one, the whole BAFTA story. I think the thing about the list that they've come up with, or the public have come up with, is that they're all very current characters. Yes, some of them have been around for a long time, but they are in current games. And that means they do all now have a voice through modern games. And it's perhaps easier to consider something to be an iconic character when they have a voice through which to express that character. If you think about Sonic, in the first Sonic, he had the way he turned and looked at the screen, the way he tapped his foot. That was the only way to portray outside of the cartoon series, I guess. But that was the only way for him to really portray attitude and character. Now he can just turn to the screen and go, hey, I'm Sonic and I'm, you know, I've got attitude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm available if anyone needs any voice acting there. Um, but genuinely, I think track and field guy oozes character. I think Arthur Knight with the way he does his little jump and splits his legs and his armor falls off. Lots of character. They clearly spent a lot, a lot of time and effort into doing that. They, mm -hmm. they must have understood the importance of having the protagonist character being that way. Even if you think to DMA with Lemmings and so on, what they did with that tiny little sprite. Yeah, or if you want to take that into Sensible, Megalomania, yeah. Cannon Fodder, what they did with that, um, putting character within the limitations of the machine they're working yeah. on. But that's not really um, a, a rule of this particular competition. No. You know, it's just across all video games. But you're right, portraying character in limited pixel art is a huge skill it's a real skill we all try to make games whether it was programming whether it was shoot em up construction kit we all try to draw sprites and and nine out of ten times they looked awful so i think we can all appreciate the talent that comes from that it's not to detract from the modern choices it just feels like we're talking about slightly different mediums sometimes when comparing 2024 sonic to 1991 sonic or mario or whatever else it's all good fun yeah it did get me thinking about games and protagonists in general. And so many of the games that I've played have no set protagonists. So they don't get mentioned. Loads of RPG strategy invention and so on, where you, you kind of end up making your own character each time you play. So they won't get represented there. But it's an, in, it's an interesting thing. Um, I know there was a, a lot of, um, th this provoked a lot of angry responses on Twitter and so on. And I would, I would suggest people, calm down just a little bit and understand that the project was never by having a public vote like this it was never going to produce a great list so it's it's fine this is exactly why they do it I know, you know, it, I know. it's it's um it's not quite baiting but it is farming reaction yeah, by saying yeah. here is a list here is number one yeah. so that people have got something to rail against yeah yeah it's a good list uh for thinking about things anyway provoking your reactions it's link in the show notes um, have a look at it. We are sponsored this week, thank you very much, by Pixel Addict Monthly Magazine, which comes out every six weeks. Uh, Pixel Addict is a, a lifestyle magazine um, for people like us and you, uh, which covers a variety of issues. This issue, current issue, is on Tandy. It's an amazing cover art there. Uh, there's all sorts of things in there. There's stuff about the Neo Geo, uh, Monty Mole and Chips Challenge. There's a NES assembly coding tutorial, which continues in it. Um, where can people go if they want to get Pixel Addict magazine, Neil? Well, they can go to the doctors and they can say, I am a Pixel Addict. Can you help me? As I did this week. And the doctor said, you're a Pixel Addict. I'm afraid there's no resolution. Oh, Neil, Neil, Neil. You can also go to their website, pixel.addict.media, where you can take out a subscription. They now do they now do renewing subscriptions, finally. Uh, you can have it delivered to your house. You can get the PDF. But have a look at their wonderful magazine. I'm here a week. I don't know about you, Dave, but I've had a mobile computer device around me for far longer than simply the rise of smartphones. Palm Pilots, iPacs, even an Apple Newton at one point. And they got more capable. And certainly on the Windows CE-based devices I had, I started putting emulators on them. Not because it was an ideal experience to play these games in a compact iPack, for example. Um, it certainly didn't have a, a, a useful D-pad compared to that of a Game Boy, a device specifically made for gaming. 
but it was just fun because you could. And I think a lot of what played into the early days of emulating on any system was it just felt a bit naughty. It felt like you were breaking the system. It felt like you were, you know, Tron somehow uh, making computers do things that they shouldn't. So we did. Okay, hacker man. (laughs) <laughs> this carried through to the Android devices that I then owned, firing up Sonic on um, SNES 9X, for example, which um, is still there. It still exists in the Google Play Store today, as well as lots of emulate, other emulators on Android devices. But within the walled garden of Apple, things have been very different. Now, I'd moved to an iPhone a couple of years back out of curiosity as much as anything else. I I don't pledge allegiance to Apple in any way. I just like trying things out. I owned everything else, including the mighty and never-to-be-forgotten Windows mobile devices. Um, So I thought, let's live with iOS for a while. And it won't be news to anyone that I found it to be a mature, well-put-together experience, in part due to the careful curation of what Apple does and doesn't allow you to put on that device. And that doesn't include code that's run from an external source outside of their control. Now, what falls into that category? Well, code in ROM files, of course, the games that you'd run in an emulator. So that means something like ScumVM does exist in the iOS um, app store, the Apple app store, because that's taking assets and graphics and music files from an old game and then running it in its own modern code base, which ticks all of the boxes required to exist in the app store. That's an engine. But an emulator that can run ROMs has not been allowed until now. So there's been an update to the App Store guidelines from Apple, and I've got a bit of text here which I'll read out from that update. It says, apps may offer certain software that is not embedded in the binary, specifically HTML5 mini apps and mini games, streaming games, chatbots, and plugins. Additionally, retro game console emulator apps can offer to download games. You are responsible for all such software offered in your app, including ensuring that such software complies with the guidelines and all applicable laws. Software that does not comply with one or more guidelines will lead to the rejection of your app. So it's not too ambiguous, really. It specifically highlights retro game console emulator apps. And it opens the door to streaming games as well, which will please Sony and Microsoft. But who knows, maybe Apple have got their own plans in that streaming arena uh, in the near future. If, I think they already have, haven't they? There's they're certainly Apple gaming mm. things. Mm. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't tried that out if it, if it extends to streaming. But um, I guess if Apple wanted to do that, they would just dump an app on there for you anyway. <laughs> they, they write the rules, but it opens up to uh, Sony and Microsoft and anyone else who wants to do it too. Netflix, perhaps. Now, how this will pan out, we'll have to see. Um, Will emulators allow you to run your ROM library? Uh, For example, if you've got them all on iCloud, could you then fire up the emulator and run them? Or will it see the rise, as I suspect, at least in the first instance, of the single game packaged emulator? So companies like Sega might sell you Sonic, Uh, the original Sonic, as a standalone game, and it's simply an emulator and a ROM packaged up behind the scenes. Time will tell, but it certainly opens some doors for this side of things. Dave, did you, like me, annoy the student next to you at college by showing them Doom on Palm OS? Um, What do you make of these rule changes? I'm not entirely sure what it will result in because it says you're responsible for all such software offered in your app, which makes me wonder if the downloadable games also have to be submitted to Apple. I'm not quite sure if that then means we'll only get things like Sega selling you Sonic or perhaps a classic Mega Drive or Genesis Pack 1, Pack 2 and Sonic Pack 4 and all the rest of it, uh, or whether we'll see the uh, the ability to download ROMs without the, the ability without having to prove you own them. Yeah, that line does suggest that you will be held responsible, for example, if you break copyright by your mm. program being allowed to run something that you don't yeah. own the, the copyright yeah. to. I don't like mobile devices. The only mobile device that I really liked was my Cowan iAudio X5, which is a little MP3 player, really nice one, although I played Og of Orbis on it because... Uh, I'm into tech, and I know that El- Og Vorbis was better than MP3. And the various electronic ink readers that I've had, I love those. And both of those were kind of meant to be mobile anyway. I never liked mobile gaming, mobile devices. 
but I've never had a long commute. And I think that might that might have changed things. I've never even really, never even owned a laptop ever. The devices you mentioned there that you did like, very much single purpose devices, something to play yeah. music, something to read things with, and you're yes. always going to have a better experience with that. Yes. Than as I mentioned earlier, trying to play a Game Boy game on an iPad with no D pad. Yeah. 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 I've as I said, I've never even owned a laptop. I, I'm one of the the least mobile device friendly people around. I just don't like them. I use my mobile phone all the time. I, I wouldn't go without it. But yeah. Um, I'm glad they're doing it though, because seemingly loads of people do use their mobile devices to play games, and I think the the quality of normal app store games for your phone is awful. Uh, I've tried to play games from the app store. If you browse for them, all you see is just endless lists of nasty games designed to get in-game microtransactions from you. I don't want that. Your favorite, your favorite. Do you know what? As you were saying that, I was thinking, I can't remember the last time I opened the App Store to specifically look for a game on my mobile. I just I just don't game on my mobile. Well, you can find lots of lots of cookie-cutter copycat games, uh, casual games you can play when you're on the toilet, stuff like that. And they're all designed with this idea of let's get some money from the player. And it's, it's nasty. Um, so being able to play proper full games that were designed to be complete in a box when you bought it is a huge step forward well i'm guessing these rules haven't come into play yet because i did search for emulator on Mm -hmm. the um on the apple app store just before Mm -hmm. the show and it suggested goat simulator so the the best you can do at the moment is emulator goat Hmm. i wonder if uh, have you ever played it by the way dave no i haven't played goat simulator is it good yeah, yeah. What, you, what's the one about? Is it, the, there's the one about the duck as well. Is it? It's the same idea. Uh, the goose one. Yeah, goose. Sorry, untitled goose game. Yeah, that's that's good fun. That's more of a puzzly game. Goat Simulator. Of, it just feels like a prototype someone chucked, chucked out at a demo party or something, and you go around, <laughs> kind of licking things, and it's it, think Tony Hawk's skating, but you're a goat without a skateboard. Without a skateboard. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to think what would be good and what would be bad to play. The problem with, with putting a strategy RPG or adventure to the screen size and trying to see everything, uh, and the problem with platformer shooters, etc., is controls. So I wonder if this is where innovation comes in. And if I'm thinking about a modern game on a D-pad with a couple of buttons, the actual amount of space that your, your thumbs move between is really small. So maybe someone can create some kind of thing that folds down and extends out and feels good to use you can keep in your pocket that ends up being as ubiquitous as the little horrible white apple earbuds you see um i don't know or maybe there's some better way to control retro games with a touch screen that but that'll improve i don't know yeah if you're thinking um console so you don't need it to use a keyboard for these games yeah um all, all modern smartphones have bluetooth support of course yeah. and there's a lot of you know you can pair up your playstation 5 controller if you want to yeah, um, but... <sighs> but there's also the the clip on jury pads yeah. type things that go either side so it looks a bit more like a steam deck or something like yeah. that you you can get those oh there's some fighty cats behind you um yep. you can get those so that's certainly a lot better experience than I would have had 20 years ago on, a, on an mm. iPad when you could run these things. So yeah, but, that's mm. it. But there's always going to be an element of compromise, like you say, whether it's the resolution, um, whether it's not having to use an on-screen keyboard. There's always going to be an element of compromise when you're playing a device on a device that it wasn't made for, which is why I think I really like playing handheld console games on a, on a, through emulation, or I have done in the past because mm-hmm. they're made for that kind of gaming you know yeah the, the, talking about having a an xbox controller with you in your pocket beside your phone that's out uh <laughs> even 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 just a, an 8-bit do 8-bit do um one of those controllers they're, they're bigger than a mobile phone so what you need is something that something that, that's a credit card that folds out and somehow turns into a a responsive D-pad. That, that's the technology that's needed that's cheap and ubiquitous as well. Do you, do you remember when Game Boys were out, you used to be able to buy these ridiculous things that were screen magnifiers yes. and things yes. like that? Yeah. Well, K- Konami did one, which was like, it looked like Astro Wars, like a tabletop style game. Uh-huh. And you would slot your Game Boy into it and then it would magnify the screen, do the controls, all the rest of it. What you need is a case that looks like a Game Boy 
that you drop your iPhone into. Mm-hmm. Perfect. The uh, yeah, that would work. The yeah, that that might work. The if you think back to when the Game Boy came out, the Lynx was better than the Game Boy in all sorts of ways. But the Game Boy won because it was simple, long battery life, easy to use, and it it, it was it was just a a more mobile device, a more a more easier device than the the Lynx and the Game Gear and all the rest of it. So if there is some kind of controller, it needs to be simple and easy. It was a better device for the three minutes that the battery lasted. Yeah, yeah, and then you had to go into your bag and get another pack of batteries out. Yeah, just to go off on a tangent, on but kind of on that topic, I got the um, the power pack. There's a new USB C power pack for the Virtual Boy. Mm-hmm. Um, hang on, let me just look up what it's called. It's called the Virtual Power Pack P A K from Laser Bear Industries, and um, I've put that in my Virtual Boy. And I love it because all of that, I didn't realize how much battery anxiety I had when I was playing on it because it takes six AA batteries. And if a member of the public doesn't switch it off, it will be dead by the end of the session. Mm. It just It just eats batteries. So to be able to sit down and play on the Virtual Boy without that, or without that anxiety, battery anxiety, oh, it's, it's so much nicer and so calmer. It's- is it still a battery pack that needs to be charged, or is it a, a way to connect it to mains? There's two offers, two, two options. One is just a pack that you have a USB C cable in permanently, and then the other is a battery pack that you can charge and you can slot in. In fact, there's two. There's a small and a large battery pack, so presumably you can keep the, it portable. Presumably, the the, the, the capacity is bigger than uh, throwaway batteries. Oh yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I can't see from the specs what they are, but. Yeah, it'll keep you going for a long time. Um, here you go. Four hours on a full charge, it says here. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, that's a long bus journey with your Virtual Boy, four hours. Yes. Would you anyway. Virtual Boy on the bus? <laughs> it was made to be portable. Let's <laughs> let's get back on topic. I mean, I would personally like to play what you mentioned, Atari Lynx games, I think, yeah. on my iPhone. That's what I'd like to see. Um, Atari seem to be quite active at the moment in the retro games yeah. market with new products. So Atari, if you're listening, put out a, um, an Apple iPhone, Atari Lynx pack. I will put down good money for that so I can play through the library on my phone with a couple of uh, joypad things, joy-cons connected to the side, a bit of chips challenge on the train. Turn it into a switch. Yeah. <laughs> No. Okay, Atari, if you're listening, put it on the Switch store so I can play it on my Switch, please. No, 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 not a Switch. <laughs> something, something to convert your phone into a Switch. Oh, I see. I get you. For that form factor. Oh, now we're going to get the Nintendo lawyers on us if they start doing that. That was Neil's idea. Dolphin emulator for the iPhone. Oh, this is going to get shut down so quickly. <laughs> anyway, let's see what happens. <laughs> no doubt we'll bring you some updates uh, in future episodes or in Dave's briefs in the future as to what happens next with the, the world of emulation on iOS. So, first of all, I'd like to welcome five new patrons this week. Five. So, welcome. Five. Five. Peter. Mike. I can't read that because my eyesight's going. Piero. Piero. Um, Kurgan, which is a fantastic name. Remember the Kurgan from Highlander? Oh, of course. Yeah. Better to burn out than to fade away. Yeah. There can be only one. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and David, so thank you very much, all five of you, for signing up to become patrons. Where can people become patrons, Neil? Patreon.com forward slash This Week in Retro. There can be only one. No, there can be as many patrons as you like, as many twirlers as you like, and everyone <laughs> helps to support the show, so thank you. Thank you, patrons. Thank you, twirlers, for submitting your questions. Neil and I will pick a time and go through them. I think we're looking at doing it in about a week's time. Uh, the first session of that. So thank you very much. It may well be multiple sessions, might it, Dave, because we've had a lot of great questions. So I think yeah. we won't over overburden you with a four-hour question and answer session. I think we'll just put out 30-minute answers periodically yeah. uh, for patrons to enjoy. Uh, so keep the questions coming in. Um, we mentioned the well-received Atari Mini 400, but also that it had joystick problems. 
and it seemed that the problem was not a gating thing. I, I suggested incorrectly and perhaps naively that it was to do, to do with a gate on the joystick. I should have realized you wouldn't get a gate on a low cost device like that. What it does is it works, it's like a D-pad. We've said D-pad a lot. We've never said D-pad before <laughs> in the podcast. This week is all about the D-pads. So it uses the rubber sort of mat on electrical contacts yeah. that you'll see on loads of gamepad D-pads. They work very well. There's nothing wrong with them. But yeah. Neil? The, the cheap ones tend to be rubber and conductive carbon on the back of the rubber that yeah. gets pushed down to close the circuit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but because you're using a stick, the stick becomes a lever. So what happens is if you put too much pressure on the joystick, and I I can be quite guilty of that. If I'm playing speedball too and I've got the ball, no matter how much I tell myself it's a digital joystick, I'm either moving forward or not, I lean really far forward on it. Um, and if you do that, if you're the type of person who leans heavy on a joystick, you mash the mat and it gets spurious signals. But there is a fix, though. Uh, you can uh, you can make a little adjustment to it to help and get rid of the problem. So thank you to Senor Bai for submitting the video uh, yeah. where there is a fix. It does beg the question, did did enough testing just not happen with the 400 Mini? Well, Surely you would have thought that would have been picked up on with some good you know, game gaming sessions, head to head gaming sessions. Yeah, they, they, maybe, maybe they thought, well, that's just the way it is. Maybe they've taken a D pad design and then stuck the stick on it. I don't know. I don't know how common it is. It, people have certainly reported it on it. But when I was watching a couple of videos on it, people have said, "I never had this issue. I mm. can re I can recreate the issue by leaning too hard on it, but I never had this issue." So it doesn't appear in normal use. It's only if you're the type of person like me who leans too hard when you want to do something you're playing a game right. gamers with strong wrists yes um so thank you for letting us know about that atari have bought the rights to roller coaster tycoon 3 we talked about roller coaster tycoon being 25 years old i think we prompted this purchase dave just yep yeah as a result, influence. atari have said we better buy them all so there's lots of rights issues with it and problems and so on and they seem to be tidying all that up and they bought it you know, after our chat last week um, or the week before when we mentioned it, I thought I'll put Roller Coaster Tycoon on the Pentium 4 in the cave for mm -hmm. the kids' half term session because the kids generally gravitate towards SimCity 2000 if I put that up. Okay. They recognize it as a sandbox Minecraft like mm -hmm. game and they want to play it. I normally have to give them a bit of guidance because it's not mm -hmm. intuitive. For example, you have mm -hmm. to click and hold the button down on um, power lines to find mm -hmm. power plants and silly things like that. So I thought they'll love Roller Coaster Tycoon. How many kids do you think played on Roller Coaster Tycoon? Well, the way you're saying it, none. <laughs> Not a single one. <laughs> it was there, title screen, roller coasters going round and round, begging to be played. Not a single one. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. So thanks to Lord Borak for letting us know. And on to news in brief. Loads of submissions this week. We won't time to cover them all. But um, a late submission this week, but already very popular, is a desk that runs Doom. Reese of Control Alt, Reese and guest appearances here, or as one article column, them, Control Alties. Control Alt Les. Um, <laughs> <laughs> has picked up a desk which has an integrated AMG Duron system. He picked up very cheap on a short notice. I was told it was going to be scrapped if he didn't. He fixed it up, he lock-picked it, and he got Doom running. The interesting thing is that he solved the DOS sound problem because this is a, an AMG Duron, so this is well after the DOS either. It's still an obsolete, I don't know, 20-year-old system, um, but... He solved the DOS sound problem with the newish DOS Sound Blaster emulator thing, SVMU, which we mentioned a couple of weeks ago. It is an emulator, but I would also describe it as a sort of a driver for mm. old but not old enough DOS sound devices to let them play on things like AC97 devices you would get in Windows 98 and Windows XP. Um so the end result is a PC and a desk, which he paid very little for, that's able to run a massive amount of wonderful retro games. AMD Duron system and others of that era, era are pretty much e-waste. They don't have any real value unless they were high-end. So if you want a retro machine, you can get one for buttons. Watch out for yeah. bad caps. Buttons, though. You wanted the Athlon, didn't you? You didn't want the Duron. But even 
it, it's fine though. I mean, it, it, it's fine oh, to I, have I, a dual on the Athlon yeah. now. Even the Athlons are not expensive, but watch out for bad caps because that was right in the middle of the capacitor mm. plague. Um, race has appeared in lots of tech news coverage for it. Very popular, and it's a fun video worth watching. Every desk is a PC just waiting to be upgraded, really. <laughs> yeah, need a it's, router. It's, <laughs> it, it's a form factor that didn't. That, it's that that it's the small form factor you smaller than even the des, the desktop dells that you saw in offices yeah. it, it's a form factor that didn't really survive because even um, in the days of heavy tower pcs you could buy uh cages that you would screw to the bottom of a desk yeah. and put your pc in to keep yeah. it off the floor and stop dust yeah. dust from being sucked in so it's only a small step from that to a integrated desk i'm surprised it didn't take off yeah yeah there's also some kind of legal issues with it i don't know if reese is going to do a third party's video to cover the legal issues with it. time that made it apparently got sued by cop for copying someone yeah um, the younger generation are embracing retro. Uh, Evan B. Thompson has submitted this story. I think we did mention it last week, actually, but um, there are more stories appearing about how um, younger people are embracing retro. And there was another story submitted, I, I just noticed before we came on the show today, about how people are starting to think that retro gaming is, well, it's just part of the land landscape now. It's not yeah. something that's going to go away. It is the history of gaming. And... I don't I'm not surprised by that to be honest it's a bit like saying well 1950s black and white movies they were a fad weren't they no they're here to stay maybe not so many people watch them but the ones that really had an impact on the industry people will go back and watch them out of industry uh, out of interest to see yeah. Yeah. what what it's all about um and and some some retro games really do stand up I mean, yeah. give someone a Game Boy with Super Mario Brothers on it. Is that the right one? Super Mario World or Super Mario Brothers? World. What's the, what's the yeah, World, yeah, Super Mario World. World. Game I'll get comments. Super Mario World on a Game Boy is, is fine. I mean, you, you don't need anything else. It's a great little game to play. Or Tetris or anything like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so not surprised, but it's nice to see just the recognition in mainstream media. Good Punk 2 has submitted a video from a cursed farm, and it's a campaign to stop games being killed off. I might cover this next week as a full story because there's a lot of stuff developing from it, but and I need to look into it. But it's essentially about publishers abandoning games in the least effort way they can and games just dying on their on their feet. It's a super important issue. I know that Shelby from Tech Tangents, he's been on here as a guest, was going through Windows XP games in boxes and finding out which ones can you install because they've got activation servers which have been turned off. So all sorts of games reach a point where the publisher just drops it. And that's not good. It's not, it's not acceptable, so something needs to be done. So it's like a campaign starting. It's an issue we've talked about here before, but it's campaign starting, so it's an interesting thing to see if it'll, have, it'll gain any traction. The problem is a publisher can see anything they want when they release the game, but five, ten years later, who's going to hold them to account when they just say, ah, stuff it? And in DJ Chris Fury's music section of the show, um, he has <laughs> submitted the track from Revision by Hoffman and Day Tripper. It's not the first time they've collaborated together to create an awesome track um, on a, I think it's on a stock Amiga 500 you can play it on, um, created in Pro Tracker. Uh, it's called Surveillance, and you can go and listen to it now by going to our subreddit, reddit.com forward slash art forward slash this week in retro. Links in the show notes, it's a buyer. Um, Time extension interview with a guy with a massive collection called Fraser Rhodes. He has a huge collection of retro games. It's submitted by Dr. Local. It's an interesting story because um, uh, Fraser, I'm pretty sure I've spoken to before. Uh, he seems like a really lovely guy in the retro scene. And what he's doing is he's got a really great personal collection and now he's offering it for hire. So he will load up his van with a, a retro museum effectively and drive it to your event and set it up. And uh, having seen over the years his collection and his enthusiasm and passion for the hobby, you know that's going to be a good setup. That's not going to be, you know, uh, flat screens and, and you know, a, a low effort thing to take your money. He's going to do it right. So check that out. My advice to Fraser is pack lots of batteries for <laughs> the, the handhelds. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Local. Dr. Local also submitted uh, this story about... Retro gaming, can it be the saviour 
of the whole video games industry. Um, and there is a link to a Metro article and it seems to be based around Golden Axe. Is it time to go back? Is this just some kind of fluff piece to promote a new Golden Axe release under the guise of retro gaming is here to stay? Is this what I'm reading here? I think there's 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 lots of articles now who have from journalists who listen to the show, obviously, who have heard <laughs> me saying that retro gaming has lots to teach modern gaming as modern gaming takes some missteps and uh, people get fed up with the cynical EA microtransactions and horrible unlocked content, a lot of the rest of it. Um, retro gaming is something to teach them, so they're writing lots of articles quoting me on it. Well, not quoting me on it, paraphrasing me on it. And I'd suggest they're also targeting a certain demographic who might have slightly more disposable income than another demographic yeah. by saying, quite simply, do you remember this? Then you'll <laughs> like this. Give us your money. I think that might be a little, if, I, if the cynic in me is coming out just based on my first impressions of that particular article. Dr. Dr. Local is he's part of the machine. He's pushing it. We're on to you, Dr. Local. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever give up on my love of physical media. There is something special about the ritual of putting a vinyl record on to play. I love the mechanical sound of the gears and motors when you insert a VHS tape and the machine draws it in, stretches the tape over its rollers and so on, or even its smaller cousin, the Walkman, especially when it's one of these fancy electronic ones that does it all for you. And you can hear them whir rather than the mechanical big long button. You have to put in the one you just touch it and it does it all. Magical. And of course that stretches to discs. In fact, Discs might even be my favourite of all the media types just because of what's on them. Now, magnetic storage has been around for almost 100 years. In fact, in, in four years' time, I'm sure we'll be covering it on here, 100 years of magnetic storage. But today's story is about 3M, a name which we probably all will have seen as they've been in all sorts of manufacturing of electronic storage and tape etc be it scotch tape cassette tape and much more i was just going to say <laughs> i'm sorry to break your flow no carry on it was stupid I go was on say it. no stupid no. we like stupid no i need to know now i need to know <laughs> i can't continue i was going to say would you class putting a, a child's picture on a fridge with a magnet as magnetic storage okay <sighs> Originally, the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company, uh, I checked Wikipedia to see what Wikipedia say they make. Adhesives, abrasives, laminates, pacifier protection, personal protective equipment, window films, paint protection films, dental and orthodontic products, electrical and electronic connecting and insulating materials, medical products, car care products, electronic circuits, healthcare software, and optical films. And post-it notes and post-it notes, and sellotape. Oh, no, not sellotape, scotch tape. Sellotape's the other people. That's not their brand, but that's what that's what it's called, sellotape. But in that list, what you don't see is computer disks. 3M stopped doing that 28 years ago when they spun that off as part of the business. Now, see what I did there? Spun. Spun, Neil. Oh, so you're worse than me. Into Emation. And, and Emation's a name that I know from CD-ROMs. Um, strangely, though, uh, as the article submitted by Squelch411 says, 3M didn't invent magnetic storage. They didn't invent the floppy disk. They weren't the first to make them. But for some reason, they have the reputation of being the best. Now, the article talks about how their big competitor, Memorex, came at it from a different way. And Memorex were working with computers and moved on to magnetic tape. 3M, on the other hand, started with raw materials manufacturing and put that together to make disks. So maybe that's why they were so good at it. But the interesting thing is that when they spun off um, the floppy disk manufacturing arm to make emission, it wasn't in the mid noughties when floppies were dying. They didn't wait until it was a dead industry. It was in 1996, and they'd seen the writing on the wall. It was worth over $2 billion a year to them. It was a significant part of their turnover. And even in its, maybe not its height, but while it was still going strong, they said, no, let's step away from it. I would say 1996 for floppy disks. They they weren't well ahead of the game. Um, they may have even slightly missed the peak of in terms of the value of that side of the business, but they did well to sell it when they did, I think. Get just one more year, 
it would have yeah. it would have nosedived in its value. I'm, th- I'm thinking Windows ninety five, the amount of disks that Microsoft um, Office and Microsoft Works and so on that were, pr- were producing, there was a massive disk being used for software distribution that was going to fall pretty fast. So, quoting the article, the marking the markings were clear: exit this business, all even though three M invented it to stay in this. Dogfight meant 3M had to invest enormous amounts of money in order to remain the low-cost producer with no assurance that profit margins would ever improve. Exiting it was the right decision, says former senior vice president Al Huber. And they were right. Floppy disks went from being a luxury in the mid-80s for home users and essential for business to simply being a method of software delivery and backup in the early 90s. And then by the mid nineties, when they exited it, floppy disk. The primary use for floppy disk was when you got Windows or you got Microsoft Word, for example. It came on loads of floppy disks, used them once, and sat them aside. Um, very quickly, when CDs came around, we started to use those for installing things. And finally, when the USB flash drive came around, people went to that instead of floppy disks and made them mostly redundant. But you can't have mine. I'm keeping them forever. My first floppy experience with with BBC Micros, in fact, I don't even think of BBC Micros loading from tape. It's always discs as far as I'm concerned. And the first computer I owned was an Amstrad CPC 6128, which came with a built-in three-inch floppy drive. Did your Amstrad have that, Neil? No, and you know it didn't because you were a rich boy with your floppy disk on your Amstrad, and I just had my CPC 464 with my tape. That's why you were asking that question. Um, something else worth mentioning in, in that whole history is don't underestimate the power of uh, increased internet usage. You know, this is all about data, the transfer of data, getting hold of data. Um, a lot of people got onto the internet, whether it's via, via AOL or however else they did it. And quickly, they could just download what they wanted. Um, and then there were lots of other things. Zip disks, for example. Loved my zip disk. As soon as I had my zip disk, using a floppy disk felt like a chore because it was slow and it spanned multiple disks. You know, if I was trying to transfer something large, um, CD-ROM drives, writers became affordable just after that, I would say. Uh, they were very expensive at first, but, you know, my first one was... Gosh, I think it was three hundred pounds my first CD writer, um, and that was when they were considered to be getting affordable. But they got a lot more affordable. You were paying under twenty pounds by the end of it for a, a CD writer, weren't you? Would you say that most floppy disks by nineteen ninety six were write protected, and that didn't change because they were only just a distribution method by Not that point? Necessarily, because you've got to remember we were, you know, we liked to be on the cutting edge. We were always trying to push things. There were plenty of people still using an Amstrad PCW or, a, mm. you know, other devices that needed floppy disks at that point. Uh, there were plenty of games still on floppy disk. Um, hell, Amstrad Action Magazine was still being published in 1996. Yeah, you know, wow. we were on the cutting edge. I'm pretty sure it was from memory. Um so yeah, uh, you know, floppy. I think they did well. Maybe they would have done better to sell a year earlier, but I, I think they made the right decision. Whoever was doing that was very shrewd and made the right decision. So, so many companies you hear about holding on and then it's too late and they yeah. sell for buttons. Yeah. yeah, I mean, 3M is still around today, which proves the point that they they made the right decision. Um, they had to pay, I think, ten billion pounds last year for uh, Forever Chemical Settlement. So that the um, they, that would cost them really. But they had the money to do it, and they're still yep. going. So, yeah, they're obviously doing well. Um, just a question on your six one two eight, because one arrived recently at the cave. Did you mm-hmm. have a romantic robot multiface, Dave? I had a multiface too. They are miracles. What it was, it was a an expansion device for the CPC. It originally came in the Spectrum, and they they made one for the CPC that could read the memory. And what it could do is you could hit a button, freeze the CPC, and you could then dump the contents of memory onto disk, and you could load them back in. You could actually hex edit memory as well. And in some text-based games, you could look through and find text and so on. You could do cheats through the multiface. Some of the magazines had multiface cheats in them as well. But the most important thing for the multiface for me was 
an Amstrad CPC game was usually eight ninety nine or nine ninety nine on tape. And if you wanted this version, they saw you coming, and they wanted thirteen ninety nine, fourteen ninety nine for a disc version. So fifteen quid for a new game on disc. I wasn't paying that. I wanted a budget game at one ninety nine, and I wanted a a Mastertronic uh, added dimension one at two ninety nine. And what that meant was, I took the game home, put it in my tape player, loaded it in hit the multiface button and saved it onto disc. And I had the I had the best of both worlds, cheap tape games and the wonderful multiface 2. I'll get uh, Duncan a picture for it. Uh, multiple, wonderful multiface 2 to um, to allow me to do that. And also it meant yeah. in things like Treasure Island Dizzy, the more I think about it, the more I think I must have cheated. <laughs> I must have been using I must have been using save states on that one. Save states before people called them save states. And what 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 happened with, with Treasure Island Dizzy is at the last minute they decided to remove all the lives and you only had one life on it and it was almost impossible. So I would be saving periodically, saving my game, which you couldn't normally do, uh, on this on multiface two to disc and that enabled me to get through the whole game. I'm sure I must have done it. Um, you were missing out perhaps on the occasional game that actually supported one to eight K machines, but very few offered you any uh, yeah. extras in the Amstrad world. Magnetic Scrolls did that. Uh, they 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 needed one to eight K just because it was complex parsers in their text adventures mm. that couldn't run on on the the on tape. Well, um, in terms of my own experience, it would have been the Beeb that I first used a floppy on, uh, Friends 286 PC, and then a friend who had a Spectrum Plus 3, which of course had the same three inch discs as your Amstrad, manufactured by Amstrad at that point, the Plus 3. But the Plus 3 was in his dad's room, whereby the 48K was in his room, because the Plus 3 and anything to do with a floppy disk at that point was still considered to be, as you said, a luxury. It was a premium thing. Oh, floppy disks, they're a little bit more expensive. They're not for kids, <laughs> at least in in the UK at that point. I imagine kids in the US with C64s and floppy disks, it felt very different. It felt the norm, you know, and tapes probably felt a bit weird. I had a chap from New Zealand visit the cave this weekend, and he looked around the fake W8 Smith and he said, it's brilliant. But it's nothing like our video game shop was. We didn't have rows and rows of tapes like that. It was all discs. Um, so we know we're slightly unusual in that aspect uh, and, and in the feeling that floppy disks are premium, even though that they were they were very, very cheap to produce. What are you holding up there? This is a small box game for the C64, which is called Trilogy. It says three mind-stretching mind adventures. Now, tell me if you recognise it. Um, Kobashi, Naru, Shard of Innovar, and Venom. Recognise those? Who made those? Can you see the logo on um, the screen? It's a very blurry picture. I can't... See the logo? Oh, Mastertronic. I can see it yeah. now. Mastertronic. So this is a US Mastertronic release. So Mastertronic in the UK released games at one ninety nine and two ninety nine on budget on tape. Loads of games. They sold absolute truckloads of them. But that wouldn't fly in America. So what they did was they published this um, dual purpose box. So it worked on an IBM PC and a Commodore 64. And it had three games on it. So they could, I guess they couldn't justify the price for three for one game, or a full price, but if they put three of the budget games together, they could get a full price release from it. So that's what they were trying to do because I, I, don't, I just don't think the US and other markets had the same budget market that we had, that we enjoyed, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up. Yeah, and Mastertronic's library was, uh, it wasn't the strongest, with, with some exceptions like the Magic Knight series. They were Sub. budget games. Sub. For a uh, for a reason, yeah, zub, zub, yeah, zub, yeah. That I had, uh, I had uh, discs and tapes, and the best of both worlds. But it's a really fascinating article. It's really worth a, a read. Link in the show notes. Floppies may be obsolete, but I'll always love them. Do 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 do. Community question of the week. If you'd like to participate in Community Question of the Week, go to reddit.com forward slash r forward slash this week in retro, where you can read the question of the week, leave your answers and read other people's answers. And then we pick out the uh, top three when Dave has taken it out of contest mode, which I it's think out. you've done. 
Fantastic. Yep. So the question of the week was, we want to know what game do you like to get lost in? Is there a game where your imagination has filled in all the gaps and fleshed out the world in your mind? Can you see beyond the pixels? Ooh. So Dave, I will, uh, you take the first one, Dave, while I clear sure. my throat. Imaginary Swing 8606 says, Fallout 3 or 4. Many games lost on these, and after completing the game, putting it into God mode and just wandering. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, there's there's so much that... One of the, the good things about Fallout 3 and 4 compared to the Elder Scrolls is that everything in it feels handcrafted. You don't feel as if there's as much procedural generation going on, and there's lots of hidden things to see. You really do feel as if it's a, a real place you're exploring. Fantastic. Just had a moment there, Dave. We're an hour into the, the show, uh, and I just thought, did I press record? Thankfully, I did. So we're all good. We're all good. I always um, check that at the start. <laughs> the next answer comes from Happy Coding ZX. says, I think I'd have to go with the Yakuza series, especially Yakuza 0, which is the pinnacle. It has an amazing and ridiculous plot with a great cast. It's a beat 'em up collect 'em up a fighting game, an RPG, and so much more. And when you're not following the main story, you can wander around late 1980s Japan, playing pool or darts and getting drunk in bars, going bowling, playing scale electrics, or baseball, karaoke, betting on cat fights. We can do that at your house, Dave. Or getting training from a fighting master. Or you can also do that at your house, Dave. Not to mention disco, disco dancing also at your house. Running your own nightclub and real estate company, visiting a casino, going fishing or playing mahjong. There are also dozens of ridiculous, quirky Japanese side quests that are laugh out loud funny. Did I mention it also has arcades with Outrun, Space Harrier and Hang On as well? There you go. So wow. that, I mean, I haven't played deep into the Yakuza series. I remember firing it up. I got an Xbox to try it out. Um, Shades of Shenmue, um, especially with the arcades in there that you can explore. It sounds like I need to go back and explore it uh, a lot more from that post. Even Control Alt Reese has been in there saying Yakuza Zero was absolutely brilliant. And Trevor Keverson. So thank you for participating in that conversation. Dave, what's the next answer? Jeff Mendoza says, if I wanted to win this, I would say Outrun and the Ultima series. Oh, Jeff wins. I'm going to give him an upvote. There we go. Too late now. If I, to be honest, out. <laughs> if I wanted to be honest, it's Super High On, which is a better game than Outrun. Oh, hang on. I'm taking Force my vote away. I'm taking my vote away. <laughs> and Shining Force 2 in the Mega Drive. Shining Force 2 was a game that I could get properly immersed in and still can, despite the paucity of pixels. My brain fills in the gaps for what is essentially a quite blocky RPG with turn-based combat. Super Hang On got me into bikes. When I'm out for a ride now, I'm always flicking back to the memory of long rides across the Sierra Nevada in the game. In real life, I'm not beating other riders with a chain, no. <laughs> I also have to mention Factorio. Even though it's a modern game, I've been playing it since early betas about 10 years ago, and the graphics were always quite basic. It's the game I put most hours into. It's very easy to get lost in for 12 hours straight. And remember that we did say that it didn't have to be a game that you chose. So Richard no. Shears has chosen Vista Pro on the Amiga. He shared with us on Discord a boxed copy that he has of it because for most of us, we experienced that as a cover disc and it was a fractal world generating piece of software where you could really lose yourself generating landscapes. Uh, I think Richard had the luxury of an Amiga 2000, I think he said, with a with an accelerator and an FPU. So he was bashing out landscapes quickly, whereas I was trying to set the scene, set it to render. I'd go to school. I'd come back at the end of the day in the hope that one frame had finished rendering and invariably find that I'd pointed the camera at the side of a cliff and it, <laughs> it was it would have rendered the whole world and then at the last minute it would have just put a, poly, a grey polygon right in front of the camera and blanked it all out. <laughs> Any other answers that stand out there for you, Dave? Richard did mention Quake 2 as well, and he says modern Skyrim. Uh, and now I'll shut up and listen to The Cures A Forest. Mm -hmm. um, the Settlers, Fiskett said The Settlers, he says, about having the control I haven't got in real life. That's got to be a part of the appeal with the sandbox games. Yeah. Um, of We Design Monty, Master of the Lamps. Who posted that? A Swedish Monty was 
testicle entropy. Did yeah, you know that, Neil? <laughs> I did see that. Osprey Shower says, champ man, championship manager, hugely oh, addictive yeah. game. Yeah. Um, we've also got the Bard's Tail from Limey Tank. Who uh, did, who, who put, put, put Master of the Lamps, Neil? Uh, that was P P P P P P P P P P P P P P P two. Thank you. Good username. Um, Flaps, <laughs> nineteen seventy eight EverQuest. Oh yeah, online online role playing games. Oh don't oh don't go don't go into those. You'll eat your life. And Antiques for Geeks says Epic by DID. Yeah, that was a great game as well as Railroad Tycoon, Dapper Cranberry, Morrowind. So plenty of um. Well, deep games, really, you know, that, that are getting people really lost. If we, if we say Monty, I guess it had a big map, Monty, you know. You had to work hard to get around that game. Um, I love yeah. the music. Oh, Mon- Monty and the Run was one of the first games I had for the Amstrad. I love the music on it. Well, I'm going to give a gold star to Richard Shears for being the only one who suggested an application. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. So we've got a new question of the week. What is it this week, Dave? Who is the most iconic character in video game history? Your top threes, please. No more than three. Shall we say no less than three? Has to be three. No more, no, no less. I mean, No honourable you... mentions, no mention at all of anything else. No, just three. Don't let us catch you bending the rules. We know what you're like out there. Yeah. Uh, if you get really stuck, just go Sonic 1, 2 and Sonic 3. If you have to, just fill those spaces. Uh, but I'm sure everyone Number shall be three, three, not two. Not four and five is right out. I think this is going to get heated. I'm looking forward to this. So take part at reddit.com forward slash art forward slash this week in retro, where you'll find the question of the week pinned at the top as well as the latest episode. If you'd like to support the show, go to uh, patreon.com forward slash this week in retro. If you'd like to buy the official mug of the show, uh, makes your tea taste a whole lot better, go to where are we going? RMCretro.store and you can find it there. Uh, anything else we need to plug, Dave? No, no. no We're finished. Anything. We're done. Okay. Can we say Ultima one more time and get Duncan Ultima. to count it? Ultima. Um, and if you see Dave on the street this week, give him a cheery hello, get him to wave, and then say he's waving when he waves back at you. He'll love that. He will love that. And he is waving now because it's the end of the show. So thank you so much for listening. Take care, everyone. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. He's waving. I'm waving. Neil's waving. He's got very strong wrists. This Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RMC The Cave and Dave. It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r stroke this week in retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.